The Gulag Archipelago, Volume Three, continued. Cassette Thirteen, Side One. Three days later, he looked in again and laid before me an extract from an order made by the Oblast Education Department. Over the same shameless signature which had certified in March that the schools in the district were fully staffed, I was now in April. Appointed to teach both math and physics to both graduating classes, and just three weeks before their final examination, he was taking a chance. This director of studies, not so much politically, what he had to fear was that I might have forgotten all my mathematics during my years in the camps. When the day of the written examination in geometry and trigonometry arrived, he did not allow me to open the envelope in the presence of my pupils, but took all the teachers into the headmaster's office. And stood over me while I solved the problems. The fact that my answers coincided with those in the envelope put him and the other math teachers in a festive mood. It was easy enough to pass for a second Descartes in that place. I had still to learn that every year during the final examination there were periodic calls from the villages to the district centre. We can't work it out. It wasn't formulated properly. The teachers themselves had only seven years of schooling behind them. Shall I describe the happiness it gave me to go into the classroom and pick up the chalk? This was really the day of my release, the restoration of my citizenship. I stopped noticing all the other things which made up the life of an exile. When I was in Ekibastuts, our column was often marched past the local school. I would look upon it as at some inaccessible paradise, at the children running about the yard. At the teachers in bright dresses, and the tinkle of the bell from the front steps cut me to the heart. I had been reduced to such desperate longings by my hopeless prison years, my years of general labour in the camps. It seemed to me the supreme, heart-breaking happiness to enter a classroom carrying a register as that bell rang, and start a lesson with the mysterious air of one about to unfold wonders. This was, of course, my teacher's gift, craving satisfaction. But partly, perhaps, my hunger for self-esteem. I needed the contrast after years of humiliation, years of knowing that my talents were unwanted. But while my gaze was fixed on the life of the archipelago and the state at large, I had lost sight of something very elementary: that sometime during or since the war, the Soviet school had died; it no longer existed. There remained only a bloated corpse, a bag of wind. In the capital and in the hamlet, the schools were dead. When spiritual death creeps through the land like poison gas, the school and its pupils are, of course, among the first to suffocate. Yet I only discovered this some years later, when I returned from the land of exile to metropolitan Russia. In Kokterek, I had no inkling of it. In the deadly fog of obscuration all around us, the exiled children had not yet choked; they still lived. Those were very special children. They were growing up in the consciousness of their depressed status. In school council meetings and other waffling sessions, they were described and sometimes heard themselves described as Soviet children, growing up to live under communism, whose freedom of movement was only temporarily restricted. No more than that. But they felt. Every one of them felt the collar around his neck. Had felt it from early childhood, as long as he could remember. The whole world, which they knew from magazines and films, so varied, so rich, bubbling with life, was inaccessible to them, and there was no hope of entering it even for the boys through the army. There was a very faint chance that a very few would obtain permission from the MVD post to go to a city, to be allowed when they got there to take an entrance examination, to be admitted to an institute if they passed, and once in to complete their studies successfully. So that all the discoveries they would ever make about the vast and exhaustible world must be made there in the school, which for many years was the beginning and end of their education. Moreover, life in the wilderness was so starkly simple that they were free from the distractions and dissipations that would spoil twentieth-century urban youth from London to Alma Ata. In the urban centres, children had lost the habit and the taste for study. Studied as though discharging an irksome obligation, just to stay on the books till they were old enough to leave. But for the children in our exile colonies, 
if they were well taught. There was nothing more important in life. Nothing else mattered. Studying avidly, they felt that they were rising above their second-class status, competing on equal terms with first-class children. Only in earnest study could they slake their ambitions. No, there were other ways, by holding elective office in school, in the Komsomol, and from the age of sixteen at the polls in general elections. How they longed, poor things, for the illusion of equal rights, if nothing more. Many proudly joined the Komsomol and made sincere political declarations in their five-minute speeches. I tried to instill into one German girl, Victoria Nuss, who had won a place in a two-year teacher's training college, the idea that an exile should be proud of his position, not distressed by it. It was hopeless. She looked at me as though I had gone mad. Of course, there were others who did not hurry into the Komsomol. They were hauled in forcibly. You still haven't joined, although you're allowed to. Now, why is that? In Koch Terek, some young girls, Germans, members of a clandestine religious sect, were compelled to join to save their parents from being driven farther out into the desert. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck. I have been speaking all this time about the Russian classes in the Koch Terek school. There were scarcely any Russians proper among them, there were Germans, Greeks, Koreans, a few Kurds and Chechens, some Ukrainians from families which had settled in the region at the beginning of the century, and Kazakhs whose parents had responsible posts and wanted their children educated in Russian. But most of the Kazakh children were in Kazakh classes. They were in very truth still savages, and most of them, those who were not corrupted by the high standing of their families, were very straightforward sincere, with a sound sense of good and evil, until false or conceited teachers perverted it. In fact, nearly all teaching in Kazakh was merely the propagation of ignorance. The first generation dragged with difficulty through their diploma course, half-educated and hugely self-important, dispersed to instruct the rising generation, while Kazakh girls left schools and teachers' training college with satisfactory marks, in spite of their utter and impenetrable ignorance so that when these barely civilized children caught a glimpse of real teaching, they drank it in, not just with their eyes and ears, but with open mouths. With such receptive children, I reveled in my teaching duties at Kokterek, and for three years this sufficed to keep me happy, and perhaps it would have done so for many years longer. There were not hours enough in the timetable for me to correct or make up for the mistakes and omissions of the past, so I prescribed additional evening classes, group discussions, fieldwork, astronomical observations, and they turned up in greater numbers and higher spirits than if they had been going to the cinema. I was also put in charge of a class, a purely Kazakh class at that, but even this was almost enjoyable. However, the bright side was bounded by the classroom door on the lesson bell. In the staff common room, the director's office and the district education department, the atmosphere was smirched, not just with the petty tyranny universal in our state, but with a more pernicious variety peculiar to the land of exile. When I arrived, there were already some Germans and some administrative exiles among the teachers. We were all in the same oppressed situation. Every opportunity was taken to remind us that we were allowed to teach on sufferance and that this favor could always be withdrawn. The exiles on the staff, even more than other teachers, though they too were just as dependent, dreaded angering high officials in the district by failing to give their children good marks. They dreaded, too, angering the authorities with poor examination results, and deliberately marked too high, making their own contribution to the propagation of ignorance in Kazakhstan at large. Apart from this, special dues and duties fell upon exile teachers, and also their young Kazakh colleagues. Twenty-five rubles were deducted every payday, for whose benefit nobody knew. The headmaster, Berdenov, might suddenly announce that it was his little daughter's birthday, and the teachers would have to contribute fifty rubles each for a present. Apart from this, one or another of the teachers would be called to the headmaster's office or the education department, 
and asked for a loan of three hundred to five hundred roubles. These things, however, were typical of the local style or system. Kazakh pupils were forced to give a sheep or half a sheep each for the graduation ceremony. Those who did were assured of their certificates, even if they were completely ignorant. The graduation party would turn into a great booze-up for the district party activists. In addition, all the district bosses were taking correspondence courses, and teachers in our school were forced to complete all their written tests for them. The orders were transmitted as though from feudal lords through the directors of studies, and the teacher serfs were not even vouchsafed to look at their external students. I don't know whether it was firmness on my part, made possible by my irreplaceability, which became immediately obvious, or whether it was the milder climate of the times, or perhaps both, that helped me to keep my neck out of this harness. My pupils would be eager to learn only as long as I marked honestly, and I did so with no thought for district secretaries. Nor did I pay any levies or make loans to the bosses. The snaky head of the education department had the impudence to ask. I thought it quite enough that the needy state fleeced us of a month's salary every May. Exile had restored to us the free man's privilege, denied us in the camps, of subscribing to the state loan. But my concern for principle stopped there. I worked side by side with the biology and chemistry teacher, Georgi Stepanovich Mitrovich. A Serb who had done a tenor on the Kolyma for counter-revolutionary Trotskyite activity, and who, though now old and sick, fought doggedly for justice in the local affairs of Kokterek, dismissed from the district health department, he had nonetheless been taken on by the school and had transferred his efforts there. Indeed, wherever you looked in Kokterek, there was lawlessness aggravated by ignorance, barbaric conceit, and smug clannishness. This lawlessness was a dark and tangled thicket, but Mitrovich fought selflessly and disinterestedly against it, with Lenin's name on his lips. It is true, exposed the corrupt at teachers' meetings and district teachers' conferences, failed ignorant, high-ranking external students, and won sheep graduating students. Wrote complaints to the Oblast Center, to Alma Ata, sent telegrams to Khrushchev in person. Seventy parents' signatures were collected for appeals on his behalf, and such telegrams were dispatched in another district because they would not have got through from ours. He demanded checkups, inspections. Then, when inspectors arrived and turned against him, he would start writing again. He was analysed at special teachers' meetings, accused of filling children with anti-Soviet propaganda, and came within a hairbreadth of arrest. Accused no less seriously of ill-treating the goats that browsed on the young pioneers' garden plots, he was dismissed and reinstated. He tried to get compensation for enforced absence from work. He was transferred to another school, refused to go, was dismissed again. He put up a splendid fight. If only I had joined him, what a drubbing we would have given them! Yet I gave him no help at all. I held my peace. I always avoided taking part in the final vote, so as not to be against him, by slipping away to a club meeting or a tutorial. In this way, I did nothing to prevent the external students with party cards from obtaining pass marks. They were the regime. Let them cheat the regime of which they were part. I had my own concerns to keep secret. I was writing and writing. I was saving myself for a different struggle later on. But there is a larger question to be answered. Was Mitrovich's struggle right? Was it necessary? His battle was utterly hopeless, and he knew it. No one could unravel that tangled skein, and if he had one hands down, it would have done nothing to improve the social order, the system. It would have been no more than a brief, vague gleam of hope in one narrow little spot, quickly swallowed by the clouds. Nothing that victory might bring could balance the risk of rearrest. Which was the price he might pay? Only the Khrushchev era saved Mitrovich. Yes, his battle was hopeless, but it is human to be outraged by injustice, even to the point of courting destruction. His struggle could end only in defeat, but no one could possibly call it useless. If we had not all been so sensible, not all been forever whining to each other, it won't help. It can't do any good. Our land would have been quite different. 
Mitrovich was not even a citizen. He was only an exile. But the district authorities feared the flash of his spectacles. They feared him, yes, but when election time came around, the bright day on which we elected our beloved democratic rulers, the difference disappeared between the intrepid warrior Mitrovich. Where was his fighting spirit now? My non-committal self, and M. Blank Z, who was even more reserved, and on the face of it the most pliant of the three. We all alike concealed our suffering and our disgust and took part in that festival of fools. Nearly all exiles had permission to take part in elections. They cost so little, and even those deprived of rights suddenly discovered themselves on the list and were hurried off to vote at the double. We did not even have voting booths in Kokterek. There was one box with undrawn curtains somewhere up a corner, so out of the way that it would have been embarrassing to make for it. Voting consisted in carrying the ballot forms to an urn as quickly as you could and tossing them in. Even stopping to scrutinize the candidates' names was enough to rouse suspicion. Why read them? Maybe you think the party organs don't know whom to nominate? When he had cast his vote, everyone was entitled to go boozing drink his wages, or an advance, which would always be given at election time. Dressed in their best suits, they all, exiles included, exchanged solemn greetings, wishing each other a happy holiday. There's one good thing you can say for the camps. There were none of these elections. Once, Kok Terek elected a people's judge, a Kazakh, unanimously, of course, as usual, they congratulated each other on the great day. But a few months later, this judge was accused of a criminal offence by the district in which he had previously dealt justice, unanimously elected there, too. It turned out that in Kokterek also, he had already had time to line his pockets comfortably with bribes from private persons. Alas, they had to remove him and hold a by-election. Once more, the candidate came from outside, a Kazakh whom nobody knew, on Sunday, the whole town, dressed in its best, voted early in the morning and unanimously. The same happy faces exchanged felicitations in the streets without a twinkle in the eye. In a hard labor camp, we had openly mocked at the whole farce, but in exile you must not be too ready to share your thoughts. The exile's life is like that of the free, and the first habit of free men he adopts is the worst, their reticence. M. Blank Z was one of the few with whom I could talk about such things. They had sent him there from Jezkazgan, and without a kopeck. His money had been kept back somewhere along the line. This did not worry the MVD in the least. They simply took him off the prison dole and turned him onto the streets of Kokterek to steal or die just as he pleased. That was when I lent him ten rubles and earned his gratitude forever. It was a long time before he stopped reminding me how I had saved him. One of his fixed characteristics was never forgetting a kindness, nor an injury either. He bore a grudge against Kudayev, for instance, the Chechen boy who had nearly fallen victim to a blood feud. But nothing stands still in this world. Kudayev, after his narrow escape, viciously and unjustly took out his spite on M. Blank Z's son. As an exile with no professional qualifications, M. Blank Z could not find a decent job, in Kokterek. The best that came his way was the post of assistant in the school labs, which he greatly prized, but his post required him to be at everyone's beck and call, never to answer back, never to have a mind of his own. He did keep his thoughts to himself. He was unreachable under his outward politeness, and no one knew the first thing about him, not even why, at nearly fifty, he had no profession. He and I somehow became friendly, we never clashed, and quite often helped each other. Our reactions and our way of expressing them, acquired in the camps, were identical. So that, although he kept quiet about it for a long time, I finally learned the carefully concealed story of his public and his private past. It is instructive. Before the war, he had been secretary of the district party committee at Z.H. Blank, and during the war was officer in charge of the cipher section of a division. He had always held high positions, always been a person of consequence, never experienced the petty troubles of lesser folk. 
Then, one day in 1942, one regiment in the division did not receive the order to retreat in time, and the cipher section was to blame. The mistake had to be corrected, but it also happened that all M blank Z's subordinates had been killed or disappeared somewhere, and the general sent M blank Z himself to the forward sector, into the jaws of the pincers which were already closing on the regiment. Order them to retreat. Save them. M blank Z went on horseback, deeply distressed and fearing for his life. On the way, he found himself in such danger that he decided to go no farther and doubted whether he would survive even where he was. He deliberately stopped, abandoned the regiment to its fate, betrayed it, dismounted, threw his arms around a tree or hid behind it from bursting shells, and and solemnly swore to Jehovah that if he lived he would be zealous in the faith and observe the holy law punctiliously. It all ended happily. Every man in the regiment was killed or taken prisoner, but M. Blank Z came out alive, was sentenced to ten years in a camp under Article 58, did his time, and here he was now in Koch Terek with me. How rigorously he fulfilled his vow. His communist past had left no trace in his heart or his mind. Only when his wife tricked him into it would he eat unclean fish, fish without scales. He could not avoid coming to work on Saturdays, but endeavoured to do nothing while there. At home, he rigorously observed all the rituals and prayed, secretly, as Soviet circumstances demand. Understandably, he revealed his story to very few people. To me, it doesn't seem so very simple. The only simple thing about it is something which people in our country are particularly reluctant to accept that the innermost core of our being is religion and not party ideology. How are we to judge him? Under whatever code of law you like, criminal law, military law, the laws of honor, the laws of patriotism, and the laws of the party. This man deserved death or obloquy. He had destroyed a whole regiment to save his own life, not to mention his failure at that moment to hate, as he should, the most terrible enemy the Jews had ever had. But M. Blank Z could have appealed to some higher code of law and retorted, Are not all your wars caused by the imbecility of politicians? What made Hitler cut his way into Russia, if not imbecility, his own and Stalin's and Chamberlain's imbecility? And now you want to send me to my death? Was it you who brought me into the world? Some will object that he should have said this, and so then should all those in the doomed regiment, on enlistment, when they were giving him a handsome uniform to wear, not out there with his arms around a tree. Logically, I have no intention of defending him. Logically, I ought to have hated him, despised him, felt sick when I shook hands with him. But I had no such feelings toward him. Because I had not belonged to that regiment, not felt what it was like to be in their situation. Because I suspected that a hundred other factors had combined to decide their fate. Because I had never seen M. Blank Z in his pride, but only when he was vanquished. Whatever the reason, we shook hands warmly and sincerely every day, and never once did I feel that there was anything disgraceful in it. One man can be bent into so many shapes in a lifetime how different he may become for himself as well as for others. And one of these different selves we readily, eagerly stone to death, obeying an order, the law, an impulse, or our blind misconception. But what if the stone slips from your hand? What if you yourself are deep in trouble and begin to look at things with different eyes? At the crime, at the criminal, at him, and at yourself. In this thick volume... We have pronounced absolution so often. I hear cries of astonishment and indignation. Where do you draw the line? Must we forgive everyone? No, I have no intention of forgiving everyone, only those who have fallen. While the idol towers over us on his commanding eminence, his brow creased imperiously, smug and insensate, mutilating our lives, just let me have the heaviest stone or let a dozen of us seize a battering ram and knock him off his perch. But once he is overthrown, once the first furrow of self-awareness runs over his face as he crashes to the ground, lay down your stones. He is returning to humanity unaided, 
Do not deny him this God-given way. After the places of exile described earlier, I have to admit that we in Kokterek and exiles in southern Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan generally were privileged. They settled us in inhabited places, that is to say, where there was water and the soil was not altogether barren. In the Chu Valley and the Kurdai district, it was indeed highly fertile. Very many of us landed in towns, Jambul, Chimkent, Talas, even Alma-Ata or Frunza, where lack of rights made no palpable difference between us and other townspeople who had rights. Food was cheap and work easy to find in these towns, and especially in industrial settlements, because the local population lacked all enthusiasm for industry, skilled trades, and intellectual occupations. But even those who ended in rural areas were not invariably driven into the Kolkots. There were 4,000 people in our Kok Terek, most of them exiled, but only some Kazakh sections of the town came under a Kolkots. The rest all managed to find jobs at the machine and tractor station, or took a nominal job somewhere, even at a derisory salary, and lived on a quarter of a hectare of irrigated garden, with a cow, some pigs, and some sheep. Significantly, a group of Western Ukrainians living among us in administrative exile after five years in the camps and working hard building adobe houses for the local construction agency found life on the clay soil of Kokterek, which burned to dust unless it was heavily irrigated, but was at least not Kolkots land. So much more comfortable than life on the Kolkots in their beloved and flourishing Ukraine that when the release order came, they all stayed in Kokterek for good. The security officers in Kokterek were lazy, too, one instance in which the universal Kazakh laziness was beneficial. There were a few informers among us, but we hardly noticed and came to no harm from them. The main reason for their inactivity, however, and for the steady relaxation of discipline, was the onset of the Khrushchev era, its impact muffled by the jolts and wobbles along the way, at last reached even us. There was a disappointment to begin with, the Voroshilov Amnesty, as the archipelago called it, although it was promulgated by the Seven Boyars. Stalin's cruel joke with the politicals on July the 7th, 1945, was a lesson which had not sunk in and was forgotten. Both in the camps and in exile, whispered rumours of an amnesty flourished. People have a remarkable capacity for pig-headed credulity. N.N. Grekova, for instance, a repeater with 15 years of hell behind her, kept a picture of clear-eyed Voroshilov on the wall of her little hut and believed that a miracle would come from him. Well, the miracle came. It was in a decree signed by Voroshilov that the government enjoyed another laugh at our expense on March the 27th, 1953. Strictly speaking, it was impossible to invent any obvious and reasonable excuse for the grief-stricken rulers of a grief-stricken country to set criminals free just at that moment in March 1953, unless perhaps they were suddenly overwhelmed by a sense of the transience of all that is. Though in ancient Russia, too, so Kotoshikin tells us, it was the custom to release criminals on the day of a Tsar's interment, which incidentally was the signal for an orgy of looting, the Muscovites are not God-fearing by nature. They rob the male and the female sex alike of their garments in the street, and beat them to death. I quote from Plekhanov, A History of Russian Social Thought, Moscow, 1919. It was just the same on this occasion, with Stalin in his grave. His successors were anxious for popularity, though their explanation connected the amnesty with the eradication of crime in our country. Who then were all those people inside? If it had been true, there would have been no one to release. Since, however, they were still wearing Stalinist blinkers, still slavishly thinking along the same old lines, they amnested thieves and gangsters, but only those fifty-eights with up to five years inclusive. The uninitiated, with the ways of decent governments in mind, might suppose that up to five years would enable three-quarters of the politicals to go home. In fact, only one or two percent of our kind had such childish sentences, the thieves were set loose upon the local inhabitants like locusts, and it was only some time later and with considerable strain 
that the militia reinstalled the amnestied bandits in their old reserve. The amnesty had interesting repercussions in our place of exile. There were some among us who had served a kid's sentence up to five years in their time, but then instead of being allowed to go home had been exiled without trial. In Kokterek, this was true of certain very lonely old men and women from the western Ukraine and western Bielorussia, the meekest and unhappiest people in the world. They cheered up greatly after the amnesty and waited to be sent home. But some two months later came the usual heartless clarification. Inasmuch as they had been exiled, after having served their time in the camps and without trial, not for five years but in perpetuity, the previous five-year term of imprisonment which had led to their exile did not count, and they were not covered by the amnesty. Then there was Tonya Kadzachuk, a completely free woman who had come from the Ukraine to join her exiled husband, and had been registered as an exiled settler for the sake of tidiness. When the amnesty came, she rushed to the MVD post. Ah, they very reasonably retorted, you didn't get five years like your husband. You're here indefinitely, so the amnesty doesn't affect you. Draco, Solon, and Justinian, the lawgivers, would have burst with indignation. So no one got anything out of the amnesty, but as the months went by, and especially after the fall of Beria, by slow degrees, without fanfares, genuine relaxation began creeping into the land of exile. They allowed the five-year people to go home. They began allowing the children of exiles to attend higher educational institutions in the vicinity. At work, they stopped addressing exiles with rude familiarity. Life was easier all the time. Exiles began to rise in their professions. Vacant desks were seen in the MVD post. That other officer, where is he? He doesn't work here now. The staff was being drastically reduced, thinned out. They started handling us more gently. The sacred duty to report ceased to be quite so sacred. If a man had not turned up by dinner time, never mind, next time will do. One national group after another had certain rights restored. Travel within the district was now unrestricted, and trips to other oblasts much freer. Rumours flew thicker and faster. They're going to let us go home. Sure enough, they let the Turkmen go, those who were exiled for having been prisoners of war, then the Kurds. Houses were put up for sale, and house prices tottered. They also released some elderly administrative exiles. People had pleaded their cause in Moscow, and lo and behold, they were rehabilitated. Excitement rippled through the exiles, leaving them feverish and confused. Shall we be on the move soon? Is it really possible? Ridiculous, as though that regime could ever become any kinder. The camp had taught me to be consistent in my disbelief. And anyway, there was no special need for me to believe. Here, in the great Russian heartland, I had neither family nor friends, whereas here, in exile, I was experiencing something like happiness. I doubt whether I'd ever lived so comfortably. True, during my first year of exile, a deadly disease was tormenting me, as though it was in league with my jailers. And for a whole year, no one in Kokterek could even determine what it was. I could hardly stand on my feet in front of my class. I slept badly and ate very little. All that I had previously written in the camp and stored in my memory, and all that I had composed in exile since, I had to write down hastily and bury in the ground. I remember clearly that night before I left for Tashkent, the last night of 1953. It seemed as though for me life and literature was ending right there. I felt cheated. But my illness abated, and my two years of truly beautiful exile began with only one hardship, one sacrifice to cast a shadow. I dared not marry, because there was no woman whom I could trust with the secrets of my lonely life, my writing, my hiding places. But all my days were lived in a state of constant, blissfully heightened awareness, and I felt no constraint on my freedom. At school I could give as many lessons as I wanted, in both shifts, and every lesson brought a throbbing happiness, never weariness or boredom. And every day I had a little time left for writing, and there was never any need for me to attune my thoughts. As soon as I sat down, the lines raced from under my pen. On those Sundays, when we were not turned out to thin beat in the Kulkots, I wrote without pause, the whole Sunday through. While I was there, I also began on a novel, impounded ten years later. 
and I had writing enough for a long time ahead. As for publication, that was not to be expected until after I was dead. By now I had some money, so I bought a little clay house for myself and ordered a firm table to write on. But I went on sleeping on the same old bare wooden boxes. I also bought a shortwave radio set, covered my windows at night, glued my ear to the silk over the speaker, and through the cascading crash of jamming tried to catch some of the forbidden news we longed for, and to reconstruct from the general sense the parts I could not hear. We were so worn out by decades of lying nonsense. We yearned for any scrap of truth, however tattered, and yet this work was not worth the time I wasted on it. The infantile West had no riches of wisdom or courage to bestow on those of us who were nurtured by the archipelago. My little house stood on the extreme eastern edge of the settlement. Beyond my gate there was an irrigation channel, the steppe, and the sunrise each morning. Whenever there was a puff of wind from the steppe, my lungs drank it in greedily. In the dusk and at night, whether it was dark or moonlit, I strolled about alone out there, inhaling and exhaling like a lunatic. There was no other dwelling less than a hundred meters off, to left, to right, or to the rear of me. I was fully resigned to living there, if not in perpetuity, then for twenty years at least. I did not believe that conditions of general freedom would come about sooner, and I was not far wrong. I seemed to have lost all desire to go elsewhere, although my heart stood still when I looked at a map of central Russia. I was aware of the whole world not as something beckoning to me from outside, but as something experienced and assimilated entirely within myself, so that nothing remained for me to do but write about it. I was replete. When Radishchev was in exile, his friend Kutuzov wrote to him as follows. It grieves me to tell you this, my friend, but your position has its advantages. Cut off from all men, remote from all the objects that dazzle us, you can all the more profitably voyage within yourself. You can gaze upon yourself dispassionately and consequently form less biased judgments about things at which you previously looked through a veil of ambition and worldly cares. Many things will perhaps appear to you in a completely new aspect. Precisely so. And because I cherished the purer vision it gave me, I was fully conscious that exile was a blessing to me. Meanwhile, the shifts and stirrings in the exile world were more and more noticeable. The MVD officers became positively kindly, and their numbers were further reduced. The nominal punishment for running away was now only five years, and even this was not imposed. One after another, national groups ceased reporting to the MVD, and then were granted the right to leave. Tremors of joy and hope disturbed our quiet exile. Suddenly, without hint or warning, yet another amnesty crept up on us, the Adenauer Amnesty of September 1955. This was after Adenauer had visited Moscow and stipulated that Khrushchev should free all the Germans. No sooner had Nikita ordered their release than the absurdity of the situation, releasing the Germans and holding on to their Russian collaborators with twenty-year sentences, was realized. But since these were all polizai, headmen appointed by the Germans or Vlasovites, no one was anxious to draw much public attention to this amnesty. And anyway, there is a general law on the dissemination of information in our country. Trivialities are shouted from the rooftops. Important news stealthily leaked. So that the biggest of all political amnesties since the October Revolution marked no special day and was proclaimed on September the 9th in a single newspaper is Vestia. And even there, on an inside page with no comment whatsoever, not a single article to keep it company. How could I help being agitated? I read it. Amnesty for persons who collaborated with the Germans. Where did that leave me? Apparently it did not apply to me. I had served in the Red Army throughout. To hell with you, then. So much the less to worry about. Then my friend L. Z. Kopelev wrote from Moscow. He had flourished this amnesty in a Moscow militia station and talked them into giving him a temporary residence permit. Shortly after, they had sent for him. What's the idea? Trying to bamboozle us, you weren't a collaborator, were you? No. And you did serve in the Soviet Army? Yes. Right. Get the hell out of Moscow within 24 hours. He stayed where he was, of course, but after nine in the evening I'm on tenterhooks. Every ring of the bell, I think they've come for me. 
I thought with pleasure how much better off I was. Once I'd hidden my manuscripts, I did this every evening, I slept like a babe. From my clean desert, I imagined the teeming, fretful, vainglorious capital, and felt no urge at all to go there. My Moscow friends, however, insisted. Why have you taken it into your head to stay there? Ask for a judicial review. They have started reconsidering cases. Why should I? Where I was, I could spend a whole hour watching the ants who had bored a hole in the mud-brick foundations of my house without foremen, warders, or commanders of camp divisions carrying loads of husks for their winter store. One morning they suddenly failed to appear, although the ground outside the house was strewn with husks. As it turned out, they had anticipated long before. They knew that there would be rain that day, although the cheerful sunny sky gave no warning. After the rain, the clouds were still heavy and black, but they crept out to work. They knew for sure that it would not rain again. There, in the silence of exile, I could see with perfect certainty the true course of Pushkin's life. His first piece of good fortune was his banishment to the south. His second and greatest, his banishment to Mikhailovskoye. There, he should have lived and gone on living instead of hankering for other places. What fatal compulsion drew him to Petersburg? What fatality prompted him to marry? Still, it is difficult for a human heart to follow where reason leads. Difficult for a wood chip not to sail with the pouring stream. The Twentieth Congress arrived. For a long time we knew nothing about Khrushchev's speech. They started reading it to some people in Kokterek, but kept it secret from the exiles, and we learned about it from the BBC. But Mikoyan's words in an ordinary open newspaper were enough for me. This is the first Leninist Congress since such and such a year. I knew that my enemy Stalin had fallen, which meant that I was on the way up. And so I applied for a review of my case. Then, in spring, they lifted sentences of exile from all 58s. In my weakness, I abandoned my crystalline exile and went into the turbid outside world. The feelings of a former Zek as he crosses the Volga from east to west to travel all day in a clanking train over the wooded Russian plain do not form part of this chapter. In Moscow that summer I phoned the public prosecutor's office to ask how my appeal was going. They asked me to call another number, and the cordial, unassuming voice of an interrogator invited me to look in at the Lubyanka for a chat. In the famous office on Kuznetsky Most, where passes were issued, they told me to wait. Suspecting that somebody's eyes were already on me, studying my face, in spite of my inattention, I put on a look of good-natured weariness and pretended to be watching a child who was playing, with no enjoyment at all, in the middle of the waiting room. Just as I thought, my new investigating officer was standing there in civilian clothes, observing me. When he had satisfied himself that I was not a white-hot enemy, he came up and very amiably took me to the big Lubyanka. While we were still on the way, he was full of regrets that my life had been so horribly messed up. By whom? That I had been denied wife and children. But the stuffy, electric-lighted corridors of the Lubyanka had not changed since I had been taken through them with shaven skull, hungry, sleepless, buttonless, hands behind my back. What a brute of an investigator you got, that Yedzapov. I remember his name. He's been demoted since. He was probably sitting in the next room and calling my man names. I was in counter-espionage, the naval branch of Smirsch. We didn't have people like that. Ryumin was one of yours. You had Levshin and Libin. But I nodded innocently. Of course you didn't. He even laughed at my 1944 witticisms about Stalin. You put it very neatly. He praised the stories I had written at the front which were on the file as incriminating evidence. There's nothing anti-Soviet in them. Take them, if you like. Try and get them published. But I refused in a feeble, almost expiring voice. Heavens no, I'd given up literature long ago. If I live another few years, my dream is to study physics. Seasonal camouflage. This is the game we shall play from now on. Spare the rod and spoil the... Man, 
prison was bound to teach us something, if only how to behave in front of the checker GB. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette.